I'm going to try to pack in a lot within the time we have. Because it's usually like, a, in terms of person planning, it's, it's usually at least a half a day or a full day in training. So I'm a, unfortunately, I'm going to spend more time talking than I usually would. Um, but we do want to have as much interaction as we could, as we can within the time. But as you know, this is one of the required trainings. So we want to make sure we touch some of the key topic areas. And, and certainly if there are questions that come up after, we can figure out a way to kind of respond. Um, I also sent to Roseanne a copy of a, of a tool that we developed uh, uh, 10 years ago um, that we piloted with Bay Path Health Services and with um, the deaf case managers at DMH and a number of other people. So there's some things in there that could help stimulate your thinking as you're working with individuals. And I think we're was going to take a look at it and review it a little. And um, as, as I said, you know, there's information there that can help, uh, that I think can help you out. There's a lot of forms, a lot of paperwork, but I'm sure you're already inundated with forget about all of this. So it's not meant necessarily for you to use to fill anything out, more to help you as you're working with. So before we get started, I'm just, can people hear me? Okay. Um, how many people are, were newly hired to do the role of the, uh, in terms of the community partners? You? And the rest of you are working within your respective agencies, doing other things that have picked up this, this role. Okay, great. Um, to start us off, does anyone want to quickly give an example of something you did this morning that really is part of what you need to do that makes your day feel a little better? Um, or something that happened this morning that made your day feel a little better? Took a shower. Took a shower. <laughs> <laughs> I know, for me, I, I exercise in the morning before I okay. eat. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I deliver uh, an equipment for a consumer. And it makes your day better. And if we don't do those things, we'll get into a little more in a second then it hurts our day. And I think a lot of times that you're thinking about your role and that's part of the essence of what we'll be going through with first set of planning is really getting to know the individual and what's important to them. And oftentimes we overlook that. And you know, if someone's going to um, a debilitation program or other kind of services, if the day doesn't start off right, it impacts them. And, and we lose a sight of that a lot. And that's part of what I'll, um, you know, I'll be going going through. So last night I had dinner with a, a friend of mine, and he orders his drink, and he says to the waiter, he, he only wants one ice cube. So if it came with no ice cube or two ice cubes, it would have ruined his dinner. We all have our little quirks. It's interesting to hear this little quirk about him. <laughs> but um, and that's part of what we want to. Um, we want to get across today. Um, so in many ways, person planning has been talked about and used for many, 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 many years. And, but it is still a challenge today to really look at things differently. And um, you're going to be faced with some of those challenges given the number of people you'll be working with. Because um, if you're working with 80 or 90 or 100 people, I don't know what, what's the number here that looks 100. like? 100, yeah. So to do the essence of what person planning is, is gonna be challenging. So you're gonna have to pick and choose, you know, from what we discussed today, and as you're learning more and more, um, what's realistic for you to do and accomplish. So part of this is, is really how you approach things and how you think about things, um, and uh, given the limitations. So that's clear. Um, and part of that will also kind of relate to, um, in terms of the long-term services and supports, how some of their programs may need to adjust as you're identifying some of their needs. So a traditional rehabilitation program may not make sense for that person. And then you're going to be kind of working with a service provider on maybe how to make some you know, adaptations to what they're thinking about, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. So we'll go through a lot of that. Um, but I just want to acknowledge up front 
that there are limitations in terms of what you can do. Um, and I think you want to approach it just from kind of how you think about things. Um, so we want to try to get a shared understanding of what person planning is, understand the differences between person planning and the more traditional service planning, um, becoming a little familiar with the role of facilitator, because in some ways that's a role you're going to play in supporting the individuals that you work with, and, and how you can support the individual to take as much control over the process as desired. Um, and some of that could bump up against um, what's coming from the healthcare professionals. Um, because a lot of physicians don't necessarily support individuals to have a lot of control over their health care. I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but certainly I have in terms of, of things that I wanted to do that I didn't really have much of a choice about. Um, that's changing. I think there's a lot more discussions about person-centeredness in the healthcare field, but it's certainly going to be a challenge. Um, so when I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, my specialist, the urologist, you know, when I met with him, he didn't give me a choice. He said, "Look, I already scheduled the surgery, you know, etc." And then it was just through, you know, some chance that I was talking to a friend of mine, and she said, "No, no, 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 no. you want to get a second opinion." And which I did, and the second doctor had a totally different perspective. And I had to call the first doctor, and he took the time to go over all the options. So I had to call the first doctor and say no. And it was, it was not that easy. Um, so I waited until I was in Indiana, driving to some meeting, far away so I couldn't hear him <laughs> complain about that I wouldn't trust his judgment. He had the MD after his name. He graduate of Harvard Medical School, he went to Mass General for his residency, just like my other doctor. You know, so it's it's a tough thing and, and your role is more limited in terms of coordinating across, you know, long term services and health care and behavioral health, um, a little different than the you know the behavioral health community partners. Um, so that's gonna be you know more of a challenge I think as this thing um, you know plays out. So, in terms of what I mentioned earlier, do one of you want to just get us going with what your morning routine is in the morning? From the sec second before you wake up until you walk out of the door. I, you don't need to say anything that's embarrassing. Oh, no. I, I don't embarrass <laughs> you. Um, so, I wake up in, out of habit. I reach for my cell phone to check the time and the weather. And to get up, I do my, uh, I brush my teeth, wash my face, do my meds. I have two AFC participants, and I get their, to get them going, do meds and breakfast, and um, put around the house for a little bit, and then shower, get dressed, and out the door. So do you use a particular kind of shampoo or soap? I use um, Dove Body Wash. Mm -hmm. The cucumber melon one. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> uh, the cucumber melon one. Or I use uh, Japanese Blossom um, shower gel. Okay. And then I have um, So what if you're forced not to use that kind of shampoo? If you could only use uh, Johnson and whatever. I can't even You want to know how I read? Yeah, yeah. What would you My read? significant other use it all the dough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 So it throws me off. It throws me <laughs> off. It throws you off, yeah. yeah. Can anyone think of an example of someone that you work with that um, um, is, has reacted to something that, uh, in terms of their day and what they were forced to do or what they couldn't do, whether it's using a shampoo or exercising or whatever? Anyone have had that experience with someone that you work with? <coughs> Well, my AFC for two, oh, sorry. No, go on, and then I'll get to you. No, she can go All right. <laughs> uh, like Monday through Friday, we really try to keep our clients on a good routine. Mm -hmm. And if a, a staff comes in and they throw off the routine and they say, we can't do this today, they might get really affected yeah. by that. Yeah. And it affects them. Uh, my um, uh, girlfriend's daughter, so she's 22, she has autism. Uh, she just moved into the adult system in terms of her services. And she has got to have her nails done every Sunday night. And if she doesn't, 
she could have a significant meltdown. So unless you know that and capture that, someone else who may provide services to her, she'll be moving into shared living shortly. Um, if that provider does not, caregiver does not know that, mm -hmm. it's gonna significantly impact her quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, so the morning routine is the essence of, I believe, in terms of first set of plan, is capturing that. And one of the other thing is capturing that and having it somewhere. So if you leave or there's turnover elsewhere, everyone knows these things are important to someone. Because mm -hmm. um, what makes a quality of life? Right? It's a lot of it is the small things. Um, you know, a, you know, example is the flexibility in restaurants. Right? If someone goes out to eat, there has to be choices of something that they enjoy, as opposed to a hundred choices of none of which which they like. So if they're a vegetarian, it doesn't help them if there's a hundred options if every one of them has um, meat in it. Um, so we want to really capture what's critical for the person, um, and uh, and then the belief is, and the actual what happens is, it leads to a high quality of life, and and that's where the interconnectedness is between all the act, all aspects of the person's life and the long-term services and support, because there's a direct correlation. If you're miserable, even if the program you're going to is good, it's going to impact it. Um, but also part of it is how could, knowing this information about the person, having the person have a stronger voice, how will that change the services? Because right now, a lot of people do not choose the services, right? They, you know, they may choose the, amongst these three rehabilitation programs, but maybe none of them is what they really, what they really want. Um, so how do you provide that advocacy to making sure that information is, is captured? Um, and we want to think about what you can do around that with the individual and how you can impact the services as, you're, as this is playing out. What could be your role in, in trying to um, really get at this and help improve the person's quality of life? I know exactly what they want. Right, and then what would your role be in terms of once yeah, you do that? Making sure that you give them all the information that they need and resources that's available and options and choices. So that's a great example. So there's two things. One, how you support the person for themselves to have a stronger voice um, and feel comfortable for um, raising issues, which is a challenge for a lot of people with disabilities. I met with a group of people and one of them after an hour of discussion, talked about how she doesn't like um, who she's living with. Um, because a lot of times we, we make the decisions where people live and who they live with. And um, so out of that came five other people started talking about what they didn't like about where they were living and who they were living with and who the staff might be because the staff was necessarily no didn't take into account what their individual needs are. So one role is to help support the person have a stronger voice, and the other role is to really work with the person and, and help advocate on the person's you know, behalf. So it used, to, it used to baffle me when I used to go and clean my grandmother's apartment a little, and she used to be so angry about it. And I scratched my head and, I mean, probably in the middle of doing one of these presentations, it dawned on me that I didn't put the things back where she had them. How many people have had their house cleaned and come home and couldn't find it? Has that happened to anyone? Yeah. And it really impacts, impacts your day, right? Um, and so that I finally dawned on me that was what's happening. You know, she had things the way she, um, you know, she, um, you know, wanted to. Um, you know, and, uh, and that's what's critical. So from CMS's perspective, the Centers on Medicaid and Medicare, in order to have a sustainable healthcare system that supports independence, health, and quality of life through person-driven services and supports. I am a firm believer if the person is driving the services and, and really involved <coughs> in laying that out and, and put in the driver's seat, it not only has an impact on their quality of life, but as this whole, eight, you know, the ACO and the MCOs 
play out, it really impacts health care. I'm going to talk a little about that. Because there's a direct correlation, and more and more research just reinforces it all the time, um, on, on, the, on if the person is living the kind of life they have and have relationships and interactions with people, it has a significant impact on their health care costs. You may not see it tomorrow, but you'll see it a year from now or two years from now. Um, and there's kind of more and more, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the circle of supports, which I think is really a more, one of the more critical things that, um, that I want to go through today in the, in the time we have. Um, so the first set of planning is a process that's directed by the participant, really to identify the strengths and capacities and preferences and needs and desired outcomes of the person. And as I said, there's, there's tools to help facilitate that as you're kind of going through it. You know, you'll kind of have a better sense and a better feeling for what that means. I mean, I was doing one of the trainings, people were observing me, talking to the person. And, and, you know, we had this conversation. He mentioned that, you know, he wants to go to Las Vegas because he likes buffets. And he heard that Las Vegas has some great buffets. And I started to talk to him about, oh, yeah, my son's in. I got another story, which I was debating whether to tell, but I think I will. It was another Las Vegas story. Um, but I talked to him about my son being in Las Vegas, and we had this whole conversation. And this was someone that the staff who knew him, who thought they knew him, said he would never really open up to me. But because I kind of connected, because I talked about my, my son, he started talking about the things that are important to him and important to his life. Um, and the staff said that their, um, their agency, they would have gotten reprimanded by their agency, because their policy of that agency is you don't get into anything personal with people you support. And you'll see as we go through this, in the, you know, you need to in terms of really focusing in on the person. I mean, the other example was someone who um, wanted to go to Las Vegas because he heard about prostitution and he had a tough time meeting women. And people were really worried about that. Um, and then I called my son and I said, you know, I was joking with him, I said, you know, we have this person who's come to Las Vegas, I want you to meet him at the airport and make sure of everything, blah, blah, blah. And then my son reminded me that prostitution is not legal in Las Vegas. Um, and then, of course, we all had the visions of this person get arrest, getting arrested <laughs> in downtown Las Vegas and, and the whole headline in the newspaper, um, you know, the next day. Um, which, which is a challenge, because the other piece of this, as we'll talk about, is people taking risks. And, and sometimes, you know, we view things as if something appears in the top fold of the Boston Herald, we don't want that to happen. Um, because supporting people with disabilities to take risks is not necessarily, they're not living in necessarily um, an environment that really supports people to take risks. Because in taking risks, sometimes things will happen. Have any of you learned by your mistakes? No, I'm not asking anyone to reveal any <laughs> mistake, never. Um, but um, we all make mistakes and we learn from them. And, um, you know, so that's another challenge. So there's, so the, the person that planning is a process. It's an ongoing process. It's not a one-time, you know, um, you know, event. So part of um, kind of the framework here is the person setness in terms of the planning process, uh, the individual control, which you want to support as much as possible. Um, you know, that will lead to higher quality and across the integration. What we discussed across the behavioral health, the physical health and the, um, the long-term services. Um, I'm gonna skip over a couple of these things. Um, so even, even though, but the slides are available, if so you have, you can kind of, um, you know, look at them. So even though we also, we oftentimes include individuals and other advocates in the care planning, they, of, they often um, um, allow them to only have a marginal role and fail to provide the important information that enable them to participate fully and effectively. And I think that's one of the initial challenges for all of you, um, is there, there are a lot of people you'll be working with that really would embrace this um, and really feel they're really in control. And others you're gonna need the support. 
to, to be able to feel they could do that. And that could range from various strategies of where you meet the person, um, you know, how you connect with them. There was someone I met with in a state hospital, and I happened to wear a purple shirt. Um, and afterwards, this, and she really connected with me, which surprised me a little. Um, and afterwards, the staff said, it's a good thing you wore purple because she never would have talked to you. Purple happens to be your favorite color. And I'm thinking, what should have happened? What do you think should have happened? You should have known that. Well, exactly. And as like I said, it would have been nice for you to tell me this before, which is coincidental. But that's what you want to do. You want to be able to like, connect and identify and then, um, and then capture that and support the person to really have more and more control. The other thing is you have to be comfortable with the imperfections, you know? Um, which is, I think, some level might, is going to be a challenge. Um, because the system doesn't necessarily like things to be so fluid and, and, and ch ever changing. Um, so it offers the richness of imperfection at the expense of order and control. The more you control, the more you have order, the less the person is really going to be in control. Um, now, you, you have all kinds of requirements that you have to satisfy, so you'll be balancing all of that, all of that out. Um, there's <coughs> someone that I knew that, that she identified had the, you know, what her visions were, um, and they were written down, and she, she taped them on the, um, uh, the wall in her bedroom, to constantly reminding her that she's really the person that's um, dictating it. So the planning is a collection of tools and approaches, and you'll have to figure out what approach you feel most comfortable with um, based upon the shared values that is used to plan with the person, not for them. Um, and we'll talk a little more about um, it's a lot easier to make decisions for people, and people that make decisions that are outside your comfort zone. Um, these tools can be used to help the person think about what's important in their lives and also think about what would make a good future. And that's the whole idea also of the morning, morning routine, is you're connecting with someone at the very essence of, of who we are and what's important, and then you build, build from there. Planning should build the person's circle of support and involve all people who are, who are important to the person's, um, the person's life. Um, so we're moving from a system, you know, that's um, a service planning system, where the system's driving it to a more person-directed process, the individual identifies what's important to him or her, and expanding the circle of support. Um, I'm going to get into a little more of that, but part of when um, the Robert Johns Foundation first funded uh, self-direction across the country, ironically, the foundation was concerned with managed care for people who needed long-term services and supports. Um, so what they funded back in the 90s was more self-direction as an alternative to managed care. That if people had control over their resources, control over their lives, they'll leave a higher quality of life, and they're only going to use their dollars for things that are important to them. So at some point, they actually will save, save money. But one of the biggest things that were identified in terms of the success of that is the expansion of people's relationships. And that, you know, kind of led to, you know, less hospital admissions or less use of the emergency room, um, and you know, and that's what you want to, you know, try to capture. Um, so an individual I work with, he he was very lonely and isolated, and used to call the emergency room, the police to take him to the emergency room because that was his connection with mm -hmm. people, um, and. That was on one hand. On the other hand, he pulled back from all his friendships. You know, he, he, he got this close to the person and then he pulled back. Um, so it's through the process and talking and, and thinking and that um, collectively um, what we came up with with him was moving into an in-law apartment um, with, uh, in someone's house. Who was very, who knew everything and, was, and really was open to this. So he had someone right there if he wanted to connect with them, and he also had his own apartment, so he he, he didn't have to make those connections. 
and then gradually, you know, they became friends, you know, and, you know, et cetera. So part of it is, is that expanding the circle and brainstorming and coming up with these kinds of solutions. Um, so the, the, pro the process, no matter how in-depth you get, um, is really a team of active people of a climate of respect, acceptance, and trust. And for a lot of people, that's a challenge to have people just really respect them and trust them and view them as really the ones directing. Um, and the climate that creates a path to achieve one's dreams. Um, this is another key aspect of this, is someone's hopes and dreams, um, whether it's tomorrow or six months from now or a year from now. Um, totally open communication. An emphasis on the unique personal contribution of each member. Um, what are the things that are important to them and how they could kind of relate, which could be, um, um, you know, volunteering from meals on wheels. It could be any one of, of a million things. Some of it is giving back to the community and some of it is, um, you know, kind of helping to support a friend, whatever it might be. Um, a client which, of course, the right to take risks. Um, so someone a few weeks ago said she wanted to go um, um, skydiving. Um, what would the reaction, if you were working with someone and they wanted to go skydiving, what would be your first the first thing that would come to your head. They're not going to pull the cord. <laughs> They're what? They're not going to pull the cord. Not me, I would probably, like, my following question would be, like, have you looked into that? Uh -huh. like, like, tell me more about that. And I would probably, like, literally try to find an information and help them do that. Help them. Oh, okay. What, uh, anyone else? I don't have to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd be scared. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And what would happen if there was, what would happen if there was an accident? If someone went skydiving, what, what do you think the reaction will be in terms of you and your role? I think we always have to respect what their decision is, whether it's a bad decision or not. That's what they chose to do. So, so we have a good communication stating that, that it, are you sure this is, you know, and these are the consequences and the risks. You're allowed to make any decisions that you make. So, some of what you need to think about is your role in terms of educating. Right, and 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 so the person really understands everything. So someone wanted to go to Italy, and the reaction was, "Well, you, we could go to the North End. That doesn't quite do it, but you know, a middle ground. <laughs> a middle ground might be, well, let's go down to New York just as an initial trip. You know, in terms of your traveling, or you travel alone down to New York. I mean, depending on the need of the person." Um, so you're constantly thinking through, but it's not just whatever the person wants. There was a headline in the Detroit News, self-determination kills my son. And because this person wanted to live alone, he ended up committing suicide. But no one worked with the person about the safeguards, about, well, you know, it's certainly legitimate to say, I'm going to check in on you once a week, or you could call me at any time, you know, whatever it might be. The reaction was, he wanted to do this, fine, we'll support him doing it. So part of this is also the safeguards you want to build in. And I would think documentation, because what immediately comes to mind is family, relatives, um, or just um, management, like being concerned about the repercussions if somebody does get injured, like, what do you mean you supported them to do that? Like, you know, so I would think that how you document it is going to be really important. Too. Right. Yeah. So it's documentation, it's supporting the person, it's maybe taking the time to educate them, um, you know, as they're going through kind of the process. Um, and then, you know, kind of taking it from there. So it's supporting the risk taking, supporting the right to make mistakes, um, and which supports the right for the person to make decisions. Um, so more and more people will be thinking differently about the kind of services they want. And it may not be exactly what currently is being offered. Um, and that's where your role, as I said again, is to, is to connect with those service providers. Um, because if you've done all this work with the person, and here's what the person wants, and this, this service provider is not getting at that, you know, you, you know then there's ways that you, you know, need to help address that. So one of my AFC participants um, wants to, she, she was working and now they don't have work for her, so 
she goes to a move to work, which is exercise, paint, nails, doing hair, makeup, and stuff like that. And she's not making any money. And so she says, well, I'd rather go to a day program. This is, we've had three meetings, and PBS has come to the table, and she still has not done. And this DDS worker came in, had all these bright ideas and change her providers and change all this other stuff and still have not. So I just sent an email out this morning to her supervisor, like, okay, like we're three meetings into this, probably about four months, and nothing's changed for her. And she's miserable going. So today, she didn't want to go. So I had to find someone to come and stay with her so that she didn't have to go somewhere she didn't want to be. Right. Okay. I mean, that's a great example of, of as this plays out in terms of what's critical about your role. Um, there are going to be systems constraints that are real, and there are going to be system constraints that other people identify as constraints, but really are not real. And, and how do you kind of balance that out, and where you put your advocacy, and how to support the person. I mean, I had someone the same kind of thing. They were going to a day program, they were miserable, and they said, I'd rather be at home, watch movies. Why do I want to go to this day program, which would be miserable all day? Um, so the hope is through this process is actually going to elevate, you know, the quality of long-term services that people receive. But you're not controlling a lot of those services, so you're going to have so that your role becomes so critical. I mean, that's what's really exciting about the role of the community partners is how you can have an impact on, um, you know, on a, on a lot of that. So the key elements are, um, you know, the individual develops. It directs the form and focus of the planning, um, whatever that might be, okay? Because people feel comfortable in doing things differently. I'm sure some of you really get your energy from large groups. Some of you probably prefer dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, um, you know, and that's, you have to be flexible in that. Um, you know, there might be individuals that are important to the person that are not going to be involved if you have a care planning meeting but it's so critical in that individual's life. So as much as possible, you want to think about how to support the person to direct the form and the focus of the planning while you still have your requirements of the paperwork that you have to, you have to complete. It establishes a vision based on the person's strengths, capacities, and preferences, a common understanding of the person's dream, um, an emphasis on network building, um, you know, some that I talked to, you know, kind of with a serious mental illness, he talked about his love for World War II. And, and, and the staff said, yes, that's true. That's his one passion. He lived in a group home, um, you know, funded by the uh, Department of Mental Health. But they weren't doing anything about that passion because it interfered with their day-to-day -day doing business. So I said to them, you know, my father lives 20 minutes away. He's 95. He could talk about World War II 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> and he loves it. And there's the, the bombers that brought to Worcester. This person lived in Shrewsbury. Um, once a year, they're actually housed in this place in Stowe. Um, you know, you should connect with my father. And, you know, he could talk to him on the phone, you know, once a week. You know, I. I don't want my father to drive to you, so maybe even you could drive out there. Um, and it became too difficult, you know. So that's, you know, kind of what you, you're going to identify is what that person's, you know, strengths, dreams, hopes, desires, wishes, whatever it might be. Um, and, and then think about the network building. You know, how can you, how can you connect people with others? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you heard this. So the study around isolation and loneliness is not only a lot about people, but it's reinforced it was a study of baboons. And the, the alpha baboon, when he gets too old, gets tossed aside. And he either gets ridiculed by the other men, um, or he has to leave whatever they call the group of baboons. <laughs> Anyone hear this research? Mm -hmm. I saw a documentary. Yeah, yeah. They do, they get put out. Yeah, so they got put out. So I don't know how they did this, but when that baboon identifies women that he could become friends with, he lives a lot longer. Um, 
I don't know what that says about men and women, but I'm sure you all will agree. Most of you will agree. Um, but the fact that, that he connected with friends that happened to be all women, he lived a, a longer life in terms of his health. Um, so the network building is critical. It's based on both this informal knowledge of the person and the formal way you get to know someone. A lot of nuggets that, that yeah. Well, you know, I've been trying in some of the work I've been doing, I meet a lot, you know, builders who are lonely, they can't get out because they're frail. And I'm doing something that they used to do years ago, to do phone pals. It's been a little hard to do, but I've got four people who were kind of homebound talking to each other on the phone weekly. Yeah. But you know, you gotta be careful, you know, it's wonderful, but at the same time, I, I'm saying, I don't think I could do this with this one, because this guy is really paranoid. He's gonna scare her. So you, know, you, it, you can't just hook people right, up. Right. Yeah. But if you get the right people, it, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really joyful to check in and see how they're doing. So that's what part of, in terms of your role, how you can make that happen of things that you do, and how do you connect with others that can help make things happen. Um, and, uh, you know, this person, uh, you know, wanted to move in with his girlfriend, right? We went through a person in a planning process. And he wanted to move in with his girlfriend, his parents were against it. Or his mother was against it. The father, I think, was willing to support it, but the father was, uh, what's the word, um, uh, deferring to his wife. So I said, okay, we're going to have a person in a planning meeting. We're going to get everyone together. We're going to discuss it. I said to him, why do you want to move in with your girlfriend? And he says, when I come home from work, I want to say hi, honey. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I started to get teary on yeah. And you think, how could anyone be against this? He was someone with a very significant physical disability as well. The mother would not budge. And we just couldn't make it. Um, as as frustrating it was, and you could feel it, you know, and and uh, you know, we had someone else who um, did move in with a partner, and it didn't work out. And the peak person in your role said to the person, "Aren't you sorry we let you move in with your partner? Because now you're very sad." And so immediately it turned to that more patronizing, protective attitude that we shouldn't have let you experience this because now you're sad. And he said, I'm glad I do, did it, and I would do it again. Now, I had someone, frankly, as we kind of talked about her having more control, how to be hospitalized, because she was so put down her whole life. The idea of having some more control, she just couldn't handle. So she got hospitalized for, you know, I think, for a month, and she came out and she said this was the best thing that ever happened to me. She, in her situation, she needed, you know, to kind of experience that, get hospitalized, get her energy back, and then, you know, kind of move back. So there's a lot of challenges in, in this, you know, needless to say. Um, but it's really, you know, you have the informal and formal knowledge, you have a collaborative net, uh, team, um, I think one of you brought out, you gave the example of, of DBS. Um, it requires a commitment to action. It's holding us accountable for what we say we're going to do. So if I said, if I work, you know, in this group home, let's say, and I said to the person, I'm going to call, you know, her about talking to you about World War II, and I never do, did it, you would hold me accountable, and the person would hold me accountable. So it really requires that, you know, that commitment to action. Um, you know, regular meetings to measure progress, to talk about it. And when I say regular meetings, it doesn't mean you're going to gather five people together. It could be on the phone. It could be one-on-one. -on -one, it could be take a lot of different forms. But some regular connecting on how things are going. Um, and a, as diverse group as you could get, um, we talked about your role in terms of helping to facilitate that process. And it is for everyone, and I would add, who wants it. I mean, I did a presentation like this after a discussion. The previous person, um, you know, was working with people who received PCA services, who were very, you know, are in control, and they're directing their lives. And she basically said that her set of planning is a crock of, you know, 
since we're being taped, they won't say what word she used. <laughs> and it was so perfect timing, because then I came out after that and said, yeah, for some people, they may not want it, but they have to, but it's their decision, and it's their choice, um, because the concepts of this process is really appropriate for everybody. Um, and, but the person will decide whether or not it, it's something they want to be involved in. But regardless of how, how much you're involved with the person, um, the thinking about this runs through everyone in terms of the things that are important. Um, what it's not is setting unrealistic goals. So you're going to have to balance that out in terms of what's really a constraint and what's not. Um, there are, you can't ignore when there's some real limitations. Um, and constraints. Um, it's not limited to what's currently available, and I think that's kind of my my hopes through this process is we're going to break down some of those barriers, and so people think quite differently. As I said, it is not a one-time event, um, you know, because if you're working with 100 people and you're pulled in a lot of different directions, and the the healthcare professionals are moving in a different way, and you have all the paperwork requirements and all the things, it's really easy to view this as just a one-time event, you know, and something you check off, as opposed to really this ongoing engagement. Um, so it's not a one-time event, and, and the goals and the services really change depending on the person's needs and desires. Um, and it's not just a segmented view of the person's life. It's all interconnected. Um, so, you know, for, in my case, um, it's the shampoo I use, which I can only order at Rite Aid, and I'm really afraid that when, as Walgreens is taking over Rite Aid, they're not going to give me that personal service and order this shampoo for me. Um, so I'm starting to stack, stock up on it. But it's not the same if if I had to go to CVS and buy something off the shelf. Um, and um, you may disagree. I think it does have a good impact on my hair. But, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's not a segment of you because that impacts, you know, throughout the day, as some of you said, um, and uh, it connects with everything. So the interconnectedness between what's important to you as a person, the services you receive in terms of long-term services, the, if you have a behavioral health need, you know, the behavioral health services, and obviously um, connecting in the, in the medical community. Um, because it's all interconnected. And if the physicians don't treat you as a person or talk to the, you instead of the person, um, all of these are, are just signals that undermine the person's ability, feeling comfortable with, um, with their, um, their controls. Um, you know, this, this basically is, is a framework around you know, in the traditional support planning, decisions are made by consensus um, of a planning team that consists primarily of staff and professionals and you know, are driven by medical needs. That happens a lot. Um, as opposed to the person driving decisions and inviting people who they feel have an important contribution to make. Um, the focus of the planning is, in the traditional way, is primarily defined by a menu of service options um, as opposed to focused on defined by desired outcomes of the person. Um, the, in the traditional system, the planning occurs periodically during annual meetings, or if there's you know, problem, a problem solving, something is going on, so it's a response to a negative, as opposed to planning occurs as, the pro, as a process that evolves over time. Um, and in traditional way, a lot of the focus is, is on fixing problems, quote unquote, as opposed to building on people's strengths. Um, so there are significant <coughs> different differences between how things traditionally are done and as you're thinking about person-centered planning. So I, I view the process as having these six steps. One is gaining the, you know, the knowledge of the person. Um, now these are in steps because I don't know how to do circles, but the, um, you know, obviously the gaining the knowledge of the person is over time. Some things you will get immediately, some things you may not learn for six months or a year, whatever it might be. Um, and as I said, to me, the critical thing is capturing that and not losing it. And sharing that with the person's permission 
to you know the other people who are supporting that person, whether it's a healthcare professional or um, you know a, a provider. Um, it's working on creating um, that circle of supports, which we'll get into um, you know after we break. It's supporting the person to dream. It's identifying those resources that will respond to the person's need, and then working on the implementation of that. Um, and then is ongoing feedback and evaluation around how things are um, are going. And then it's the constantly you know doing that in an ongoing um, you know in an ongoing way. Um, so your role as the um, as the facilitator. Um, is um, <clears throat> is really now I had this someone who's trained in committed to the principles and practice of person of planning. Um, I think uh, you know you'll just get more and more knowledge. You could kind of you'll learn by experience. You'll learn from each other. Um, you know the state through UMass is going to be putting some webinars together. There's various ways you'll just be learn more more and more about it. Um, the facilitator is the one who helps make the person-centered process happen. And that's one of your critical roles, is really kind of making it happen. By supporting the person, um, you know, you kind of help ensure that the process is um, successful. So the primary role of facilitator is for the person in expressing his or her aspirations, hopes, dreams, and preferences to ensure that these stay at the heart of the planning process. Um, the person should be encouraged to control the process to the greatest degree possible. Having him or her run the meeting, start the meeting, uh, can make a significant change in some <coughs> um, You know, I don't know how many of you have experienced, you know, the example I gave about going to the doctor and the doctor is talking to the staff <coughs> person as opposed to the individual. Um, you, know, you, you know, that needs to be shifted. Um, all of these things are, are, are critical. Um, if the person wants support, like when I went to the doctor um, in terms of my cancer, I wanted someone there because I wasn't going to hear everything. Um, you know, so that person, you know, with my permission, was an advocate, you know, etc. Um, but it's really their decision. And ensuring the person's needs for assistance and accommodations are met. So this is critical. Um, in terms of whatever their accommodation needs might be. Um, whether it's someone with an intellectual disability that needs the me, you know, me needs more time for discussion around a particular issue. Um, there are a lot of people I work with that take, you know, they're processing things, and if they are at a meeting, the meeting goes 10 agenda items fast, and they're still processing the first thing that was discussed. So how the meeting should be held, what kind of materials do they need, do they need large print, whatever it might be. Um, someone who's, you know, who's deaf or, or hearing impaired, what kind of, you know, interpreters do they need. Um, so there's a lot of pieces in terms of the accommodations, obviously the physical, you know, kind of barriers. Um, so the process needs to identify that um, in terms of what the person's um, assistance and accommodation needs are. Um, you know, you would help facilitate participation of the individual, handling quote unquote bad choices. I put that in quotes because what's bad for someone as part of that meeting may not be bad for the person. Mm -hmm. Or the person in your mind may make a bad decision and it's really the person's right to do that. Mm -hmm. There, it gets tricky when around the person's health care if they don't want to get a test or they don't want to stop smoking, or they like salt. Um, you know, I love the example where I went to this institution and you know, there was no salt available for the person, and all the staff, one staff was more overweight to the next, than the next one, and yet they didn't want the person to be able to enjoy their food because they like salt. Now, there might be very clear medical needs that may be you know, you know, would be more directive for the person to have to do. Um, and that's a really tough balance in terms of how you support someone, um, even though you may feel you're not comfortable with the person or the person's not making a good decision. Um, the most 
you know, difficult thing for me is we had someone who was pregnant and wanted to have an abortion. And it was really getting close. I think at the time, I don't know, it was, it was, I don't know, it was within a week or two where a decision had to be made or she was, or they weren't going to perform an abortion. And, you know, the family was involved. And we were, we, I worked for the state at the time, had to go to court to support this. And um, so I had a lawyer who was going to go to court to support this person's right to make that decision. And the night before, the lawyer called me and said, you know, I can't do this because morally I'm against abortion. So I said, I wish you would have told me this you know, a few weeks earlier. But, you know, it, it's, most decisions aren't as tough as that, but oftentimes we behave as if every decision is at that. <coughs> Um, my daughter wanted to have a tongue pierced. And I don't know about you, but tongue piercing was about the furthest thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did it? <laughs> I couldn't even think of anything worse. <coughs> and, and, you know, I said to her, you know, my role is just to make sure she did the education of what that meant. In my mind, it was, she's going to take the tongue piercing out and she'd be left with this hole in her tongue. So she did all this research, and no, no, but it'll fill in again, whatever it was, and she had a tongue piercing. And, you know, about two weeks later, she decided to forget that. But the problem is she replaced it with, what would be worse for any of you? Nose piercing? Nose piercing. Uh, <laughs> what? I don't know, maybe it's the same. Tattoos. Tattoos. Okay. Tattoos. She had both. <laughs> the nose piercing, and then she had a couple of tattoos, which, uh, and I thought there was nothing worse than tongue piercing. But you know you gotta you know you gotta balance all of that out. It's brainstorming approaches like the example I gave around the person moving to an or apartment. Um, we had someone who was in a nursing home and wanted to leave, and his mother was in the same nursing home and would never you know let him leave. And then the mother passed away. Um, you know his uncle became his guardian, and we had this meeting. And, and the uncle kept saying to her, why do you want to leave? I thought you liked the food. I thought you liked, you know, the people you were living with. On and on and on. And every time he said something, she got angry and angry about wanting to leave. And we were able to get at what was real, his real concerns about her moving out of the nursing home. And, and be able to address that and show how this person would get support. And she, um, and she moved out. So it does allow for that brainstorming if you have that environment on, on, um, on uh, problem solving and brainstorming. Assuring full participation where it's appropriate by family members, friends, and community members. When I say where it's appropriate is the person may not want the family member there. So it's really, and, and even if the person feels that the family member has to be there, they might have expressed concerns that even though they're deferring to the family because of whatever reason, they really don't want to defer to the family. So give, and the situation about this person wanting to move in with his girlfriend was a good example of that. But he, he was never going to, you know, kind of stand up to his mother. And for that matter, his father was never going to stand up to his mother. Um, so it, it was, it was um, something that could not be done. Um, and managing conflicts and disagreements among participants. You know, as this plays out, I think you can be faced with some of that, right? That you'll want to support the person, but other, other people involved in the person's life will be, will be against that. Um, if you had a team of people talking about skydiving, my guess is there's a good chance that other members of the team would be vehemently opposed to that. Um, so how do you kind of um, you know address you know address that, or may feel no this person should go to this day program um, because it's okay it keeps the person safe um, and not want to push the envelope to support the person to make a change. Um, so you, you know you kind of really have to play that role of helping while you're 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 an advocate and your primary responsibility is to support the individual. How are you going to help negotiate with other people who who do have certain authority and certain decisions? Um, yeah. I just got a text message from work, and there's a participant who's going into AFC, mm -hmm. and the participant has food stamps, 
and the person that he's working with says, well, I'm not going to support you in going into AFC because you can't have food stamps in AFC. So she says, what do you think? And I said, no, if you have food stamps prior to applying for AFC, you can keep them. Once you're in AFC, you can't apply. But his workers telling him, I can't work with you because that's wrong. And, and so now his members all flustered. And it's just a matter of Gaining accurate information. <laughs> right, just check it. And, and then it could escalate and escalate well, and escalate. Escalate right <laughs> Good timing. Yeah, perfect timing. Um, if, you know, and if you take it on the other example, let's say you may have to make a compromise. So you don't say you can't do this. You work through with the person and with you is, okay, what are you giving up and what are you, um, um, you know, how do you balance all of that out? We all, person planning does not mean whatever you want is going to happen. We all have compromises. We all have to make decisions. We all have structure around our lives. Um, so part of the biggest challenge, what I said earlier, and this is a great example, is what's a real constraint and what's misinformation. I, I mean, part of the frustrating thing is people all, a lot of times talk in absolutes, but they don't really know. Or it might have been appropriate for one person, but it's not a quote-unquote uh, a law. Um, so that's a great example of that. Um, so it may focus exclusively on possibilities, ignore real limits and constraints. And that's what your role has got to be. What is a real limit and constraint? So even if the person had to give up food stamps, it may be the first person's decision, okay, I understand that, and I still want to do this, because this is more important than that. Um, Long-range thinking may overshadow short-term methods and strategies. You know, obviously, you don't want to get focused in on just tomorrow without focused in on today. The reverse, short-term strategies may overshadow long-term hopes and dreams. You want to not only focus in on today, but you want to focus in on tomorrow, or six months from now, or a year from now. Someone wants to move out of their apartment, and we had someone who lived in a group home who um, was miserable and was, at times, he hit staff. And what would be the two reactions to that? We started the first set of planning process, and he expressed that he wants to move. What would be the two polar opposite reactions to that situation? So he said he hit staff. Yeah. 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 So you have some folks that say, no, there's no way you can live by yourself. You can't even control your anger. Yeah. And then you've got, you can have other people. I'm thinking staff-wise. Thinking this, and you can have other staff members that, that might think, good riddance, let's get them out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you can have those. Is that true? And what's what would be the third? The third would be me. I'm just like, all right, so why are you yeah. going? What's going on? Where would, where could you see yourself living? Let's talk about the support on it. You know, how much do you move forward? What other resources are available to help him live independently? So, how many of you have gotten angry at Comcast or Verizon? <laughs> have you? How angry have you gotten? Oh, I'm not. You hung up. Well, yelled. You yelled. I have some choice words, maybe. Well, no, with a client, you mean? No, 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 no. With Verizon. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've said some choice words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have. Um, and if I was physically with the person, right. I don't think I would have hit him, but I would have been pretty close. Um, so exactly that. So in this case, could, so, could, could you, and this is just Verizon around your phone or internet. Could you imagine if you were living with someone you didn't want to live with for months and months and months and months? You know, some of us would have a violent reaction, no question about that. So and that's exactly what happened. Some people said, you know, said to him, you cannot move out until you control your behavior for six months. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Other, yeah. Us as workers, we're supposed to find alternatives. So we're supposed to find behavioral um, coordinators, you know, someone who will bring in that extra experience and, and help the client right. through, through the situation. Yeah. And, and identify what may be a real issue. A it may just be an environmental issue because he's living with people he doesn't want to live with. And so when he hits them, that's how he gets that's he's right. trying to get his voice heard, and that's the only way to do it. So there's a quote that a lot of people with disabilities use. The only way they can get attention is by acting out. Um, because otherwise, no, one's gonna, no one ever, ever would have listened to him. 
um, until we supported him to start to speak out. Um, and then he spoke out. So, you know, my response was yours, obviously. We need to support him to move. We're not going to give him six months to control himself. And he wanted to move in with the family. Because, so we did a, you know, we had a lot of discussions. He said he never really lived with the family. And he wanted to move in with the family. So I took him out to dinner to, as my way to, you know, kind of be able to be in a neutral place and really have an open discussion. And, and the first thing he asked me, can he have a glass of wine? And he's 60. I said, why are you asking me if you have a glass of wine? No one told me there was any medical reason. Um, if there was, I would have dealt with it probably a little differently. So he ordered a glass of wine. And then, and then he starts ordering dinner. Problem was, there was no waiter there. He just, you know, just started to hallucinate a little and order dinner. Um, and then he asked me. And then he asked me, did he have a second glass of wine? Now, I, in that case, I said no. He asked me, so I said no. I don't think you should. And I said, why don't you? So they never told me any. But, but that's not a reason not to support him. So he, he moved in with a family. And this is years, years ago. Um, and um, at a conference we had, um, I think it was last year, um, a shared living conference. You know, I don't know how many of you are involved with shared living. But it was a shared living conference, you know, pe people living with, you know, living caregivers. And he happened to be sitting in the, um, workshop I facilitated probably with, with state people and he stood up and said, I've never ever been happier. This is so, I mean it couldn't have been more perfect. Um, but you want to focus in on both the short term strategies and not lose sight of the person's dreams. And oftentimes the person's dreams or what they want to do, or what they want to be, six months from now, a year from now, or two years from now gets lost because it's so much easier to deal with today. Um, but if you don't really support the person's dreams and think about how to support them achieving them, you've lost a big part of it. So it's the, it's the, the both, the, the kind of shampoo, you know, the um, everything out, the one ice cube, the flexibility when you go out to eat. Um, people won't go out to, well some people won't go out to eat with me anymore because like if I went to this breakfast buffet, and they, you know, they had fruit, cantaloupe, and watermelon. And the person I was with ordered a fruit plate that had blueberries. So I asked the waiter, oh, could I have some blueberries? This wasn't on the buffet. The person I was with was mortified. How do you ask for blueberries? They would have put it on the buffet if they wanted it to be available to you. Blueberries are probably more expensive, so blah, 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 blah. But I need to go to a restaurant where I, I could maneuver what they have. I'm not insulting the chef. I just like things the way I like them. Um, so that's important. Well, we yes. Of course. And I'm a good tipper. And I, you know, so um, so the, um, you want the, the immediate and, and the hopes and dreams. Um, action may not occur without agency with support, without agency support. Particularly like if you want to make changes, the, you have an AFC provider who's you know, kind of not doing the right thing, or how they have, it's not connecting with the person. You're relying on agencies to do something, so you don't have any direct authority over them. So you, you gotta, you know, you'll play that through. You want another story? <laughs> yeah. So the two people that are in my home have been there, one is seven years, one is six years. And if I'm gonna name the agency that they came through, um, but I have a um, strong personality, but with that strong, person me. But with that strong <laughs> personality, I also have some information. And so this particular agency um, had a new person that came on, and she was a case manager. And she would come into my home. And she had like my strong personality. So she had made the decision she was going to stop speaking to me. Yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> you know, I don't know how any of this works. And so um, she just came in, and she breezed right by me. She started talking. And she passed them, and, I, and I'm trying to let it go, and I'm trying not to go where I could go. And she passes one of them, something that says, sign is here. And so they signed it. And then she passes the other one, sign this, and he signs it. Didn't explain what they were signing, none of this other stuff. And so I 
I sent an email, the notorious for sending emails, and I'm unhappy with how I was treated at home and this can happen and da 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 da. And so the next day, the participants are at work and at day program and they say, he, the guy calls me frantic, panic. I had to leave and go pick him up because they told him he was going to respite. He said, I don't want to go to respite. They said, well, we're going to send you guys to respite because there's problems in the home. What? And he was like, no, no, there's no problems in the home. You got a problem with her. We don't, we're good. And they literally stayed home from work for a week because they thought they were going to take them, place them in respite, and not let them come home. Which turned into me filing a DPPC and just like, yeah, a whole chain of reaction, yeah. So the hope obviously is that through all of this, it's gonna all, you know, you're gonna be able to deal with those issues and all be positive and support the person in terms of their day-to-day uh, -day needs and their hopes and dreams and, and things will begin to improve um, in terms of the person's quality of life. But yeah, there'll be times where you're gonna headbutt against people and that just needs to be acknowledged up front. Because no matter how hard we try, everyone involved in supporting someone is not at the point where it's really the person directing the process. And there are going to be conflicts, and that's where I think you know the support that each of you give to each other within you, you know, within because you come from a number of different organizations, right? You know how you you know work in the context of the support you may receive from your supervisor. The brainstorming, if you're bumping up, you know, some issues with another, with a state agency, how that all plays out in terms of the, the focus and, and not losing that focus on the person. Because um, there are, you know, if, if things could happen this easily, we wouldn't be having these discussions. Right. You know, the, the most telling thing, I'm going to put this one foot, the most telling thing that I heard someone say is how hard the work is just to support people to live an ordinary life. And you know, when you think about it, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to support people to live the kind of life that we want for ourselves. Yes. And it's so hard because either they have a label or they need supports from others in order to, to do that. So I keep thinking about the story with the, the disabled gentleman who wanted to get along with the How did that end? It keeps coming to my head. Like, did they come up with some sort of compromise? No. So we could get to sleep over some, nothing? As much as we tried, we could not get that moved out of order. So there are going to be times. And so we had another person where the father was really, you know, kind of um, standing away of everything. I'll give you two other stories. And we actually took him to court to remove him as guardian. Um, it got that extreme. Um, and, you know, we've got a new guardian appointed. <laughs> the father ran into um, um, Dan Ray, I don't know Dan, oh, Dan Ray, I can't believe I still remember this, who was a reporter for some TV station in Boston. And Dan and said to Dan Ray, the state took away my, you know, guardianship from my son, this horrible state. So Dan Ray called me, I work for the state, and I said to him, you know, you got to know, that the judge is the one who takes and removes the guardian. And they don't do that from a parent unless there's a really good reason. And he would not budge, because all he thought about is, boy, I'm gonna do something great to really get out of this state. So then I had the new guardian call him. <laughs> the new guardian said to him, if you do anything on this, your, your head, although he didn't say head, your head's gonna be in court the next day. Because I'm going to haul you into court and and really nail you to the wall. Of course, he backs down. So, you know, that's a rare, rare occurrence um, because it takes a lot to do that. Um, well, Frank, we had another situation where this person's guardian wouldn't buy him a dresser, so he had all his clothes in paper bags or plastic bags. So we did. We were going to court to remove her as guardian. Um, Sadly, he fell down the stairs in the group home and really injured his back and ended up in a nursing home. Um, and so we, the lawyer called me from the court and said, no, we're not going to court on this one. So, yeah, it just doesn't work in all situations. But, I, but, I, but even with him, we were able to make 
um, some, some impact on his ability to control other aspects of his life. Um, so it's always a challenge. Um, you know, the other um, thing we've talked about, that the process can be irrelevant if there's no personal relationship, because it has to be driven by the person, and it certainly can be dependent on external <coughs> factors. Um, supporting uh, the person desires regardless of your comfort zone. We all have things that, you know, that we react to negatively. Um, and uh, for those of you who may have children, I'm sure there's situations where your sons and daughters may have wanted to do things. Um, and it's really hard to let them do it. Um, sometimes you've had to step in and say, no, sorry, because that's your role as a parent. Um, so that's a, a, a critical thing. Be cautious of the quote unquote clinical rationale. Um, you know, we had someone who years and years ago was banned from flying because he um, he did something on a plane, you know, and he, he assaulted a, a passenger or something. And so he was banned from flying. Now, the airline said, well, you know, longer fly. And the staff took that to say, he'll never fly. And this was 10 years ago. Right? So there's a so in some people's mind there was a clinical rationale <laughs> that it should never fly again. So we had this conversation about well that was ten years ago. And what airline? That's right. How do you how do you then you know kind of pull away from that to support him to fly? He wanted to um, um, go visit family in Puerto Rico I think at the time. Um, so you look at it from that positive way, not from so we got to be careful about the quote-unquote clinical rationale. I mean, we had another person who set fires to dumpsters. This is another great example because he didn't, he was also, did not like who he was living with and where he was living. Now, the positive thing is he only set fires in dumpsters, you know, <laughs> wherever. Um, and, you know, the agency that supported him wanted all these additions, these, uh, these more clinical studies because of his quote-unquote fire study. And we all took a risk. He ended up moving in with a family um, who knew his history and really connected with him and really, you know, really loved him. He moved in with the family. And shortly thereafter, she became pregnant. And she'd been trying to have a child for years and years and years. And so she took it as a sign from God that because this person came into her life, she was able to get pregnant. And he, for the first time, started to take care of his personal hygiene. And he got a job in the food preparation um, at an assisted living center. And so his life totally changed. Now, it was risky. Maybe the fire setting behavior was more serious than that. So you, you know, you gotta balance all of that. But, my note here is really be cautious of a clinical rationale why someone cannot do something. Um, and as we talked about potential conflicts between team members, um, healthcare professionals, guardians, family members, service providers who might disagree with the person's um, um, decision. Uh, this, there's a, um, uh, uh, the end of the story I just told was the shared living provider 10 years later had to move to Arizona um, and wanted this person to move with them. But the state of Arizona said to the family, we're not going to give you any supports if he moves with you. So sadly, he couldn't move to Arizona with them um, because he needed supports. And the state said he's not going to get anything. So he stayed. He, um, uh, he regressed you know, a little bit when they moved. But now he's living with another family now. But it took a while. It took a, you know, a good you know, three to six months before another family was found. And now he's, he's doing you know, well. So, um, but you know, we can't dwell on what might not work. Because you know? <coughs> part of what you'll be doing is also taking chances. And not everything's going to work. People doesn't always, this, this home maybe wouldn't have worked out. Well, like the example I gave, the person breaking up with his um, his partner, or either the partner breaking up with um, you know with him. <coughs> so, part of what we want to do is educate recipients on the power of person-centered planning and their role in directing their process. 
you know, a lot of people, it will take some time to get their mind around this, um, or the family. You know, sometimes it might be if the person is nonverbal or there's family involved. I mean, so I'm, I'm using the two somewhat interchangeably because you'll have, you know, this individual situation will drive how much the family is involved and the guardian is involved and how much is really the person. But a lot of people will need to learn about this and be educated about it and learn about it's, it's, um, how powerful it could be. And it's understanding the changing nature of relationships between people. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, what has happened now is we dictate, right, what the person's going to get. You know, you're going to go to this day program, or you're going to live with this person, or you're going to be supported by this AFC provider. Um, it's easy to dictate, right? That make our jobs easier. Um, you know, and over time, we've made a lot of decisions for people with disabilities. You know, some of our decisions may have been right, but it really should never have been ours to make. Um, so the dictating. So the next level is vetoing. You know, we'll let you do what you want as long as we agree with you. <laughs> um, and the moment we disagree, we'll step in and start dictating. Um, you know, the veto is <coughs> gives people a little more authority, a little more ability to, to control their lives, but again, it's only when ultimately we agree with you. Um, the third is, is really working through the compromises. Well, you want to go to Italy, but you know, I'm sure you'll be happy going to the North End. Or you want to learn to skydive, and I'm sure you'll be happy going to Coney Island. I don't even know if they still have it, where they had that parachute jump, you know, that, yeah. you know, and maybe that could be a logical first step, but whoever. But it's, it's compromising. You know, you brainstorm, you come up with what everyone agrees on. Because when everyone agrees, it's never the right decision. <laughs> How do you feel about that? You but can if have you can them satisfy, jump down orange. That when they do tandem jumping, you can do yeah. that in orange mass. It's called jump town. Oh, mm -hmm. oh I'll have go. to remember that. <laughs> so it's, the, it's compromise. But the person ultimately is still giving up a lot if you're trying to get consensus with all the members of the team. I have someone who got here for a lot, and, and the primary care physician said you cannot go swimming. You cannot go swimming because you're susceptible to air infections. As opposed to, you know, yes, you're going to get air infections, you've got to be careful, you maybe do this, here's what happens if you get an ear infection. But, so he was dictating, he also, was vetoing if the person said she wants to go. Um, he was not willing to compound. Um, and we just overruled him. In that case, we were able to overrule the physician. Um, but this is tricky. And of course, where we want to get to as much as possible is the person really dictating, right? Here's what I want. And your role is to work with that person to get him or her the support they need in order to be successful. It, knowing that there might be examples where they will be compromised. Um, and there might be, you know, examples on some healthcare issues perhaps where they would be the doctor dictated. Um, you know, so you may, so the challenge is how do you determine, you know, where this lands depending on this, the person and on the, um, you know, the individual. Um, so one of the person planning tools is essential life, uh, lifestyle planning. And it, again, these are just vehicles to really capture the critical information. You know, what, you know, could you identify what's a non-negotiable in one of your lives? Some of you absolutely have to have it. It's not negotiable if anyone wanted to take it away. What would be an example of a non-negotiable? A car. A car. So I have to have a car, there's no about it. Wherever I live, I have to have a car. Um, and it's important to think about this because it's the non-negotiables that you want to make sure are there. Um, the other level is strong preferences. You know, you may have a strong preference for, um, um, I don't even know, for coffee type A. I don't drink coffee, so for coffee or this vodka. Um, but it's a strong preference, but you could deal with another kind of coffee. Um, and, and what's just desirable? It's, 
So there's hierarchies that you want to kind of get a sense of around the individual. You know, what are those non-negotiables? What are really strong preferences? And just, you know, things that are desirable. Um, these are just also questions that stimulate, um, for some people, it might be appropriate. People who know and care about me say, um, like, what would someone, if I asked someone that one of, that cared about one of you, what would they say about you? Anyone? Is just smart? Yeah. You know, so it's a way to just get that information, you know? Um, you know, people would say a lot of different things, you know, about me. Um, I learned fairly recently that people would really talk about my way I dressed. So I'm wearing black jeans now. So I used to only wear black jeans. And I never realized how, many pe how much people talked about it, you know? <laughs> so, I walk into a into an elevator and someone says to me, you know, Jeff, black is not your color. Um, or they would talk because I wasn't wearing slacks or whatever the example might be. Um, to be successful in supporting me, we must. So, okay, let me. I'll just finish the slide and then we'll break. Um, so what, you know, what someone needs to know about me that be successful. You know, some people need compliments, or some people you know, kind of need to know this specific thing that I like. Um, this is, gets a little more. My reputation says some people have a quote unquote bad reputation, uh, right? And that carries with them, you know, forever. And, you know, how did we change that? Um, so those are some of the um, examples. So this is actually a good place to stop. Um, so we're going to break for a half hour, is that the plan? Um, and then we'll have about 50 minutes. So why don't we try to start right at 1 o'clock. Thank you. So the, uh, the tool that I sent Roseanne uh, basically follows the sequencing of this. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about some of the meat behind each of this, then you could ask to get a copy of the tool. And as I said earlier, it'll help stimulate maybe some, you know, either some of your thinking or some ways to kind of connect with, with people. Um, so the first, and this is, it's pretty standard if you kind of Google that and so all. There's a lot of different tools that different people use. Um, but I think some of the principles really are universal. But clearly one of the key uh, components is the person's self-reflection on who they are and what's important to them, their, you know, their, um, you know, history in their lives. Um, I mean, the question I think you mentioned earlier about things or the comment you made about what people used to do that they didn't, they don't do anymore, that they might really be interested in. I mean, it captures a lot. So the, someone that I, I talked with who um, really talked about um, wanting to learn how to tell time. And, and the staff just, you know, another example of staff saying um, he would never give me information that they didn't know. And that's part of that self-reflection and the conversation pulls a lot of that out. And so, you know, further discussion, he, he wanted to learn how to tell time because he knew where he worked. He could only get promoted if he knew how to tell time. I don't remember what he did, but, um, you know, that was one example. But where it, it kind of most resonated is, um, you know, the person had got a lot of information from this individual around his love of animals. And his, um, his wife had passed away and his dog had died. And in response, he would let in the neighborhood wildlife into the house. You know, the chipmunks, the squirrels, the, um, the um, birds. You can imagine when the uh, person in your position went to visit him, what the house looked like. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> so the traditional reaction to that, what, what would that be? You know, if you went into someone's home and there were squirrels and chipmunks and, and what they left behind, what would your reaction be? 
Right. And so what would you want to do? Well, you know, oh, right. And then what? <laughs> you would you would raise the question whether he was capable of living by himself. So because the person had really gotten to know the individual and his love of animals, um, what she thought about is why don't we bring a just pet therapist into that, you know, the meeting. So she tracked down this woman who was a pet therapist. A lot of times I say this and people's reaction is, oh, I didn't think there was a therapist for the or something like that. But, but she came and met him. He really connected with her and her um, therapy dog. And he was able to stay in his home, clean it up, got to engage with her. Um, you know, she visited him on a regular basis with her dog. And uh, he stayed in his home. Um, and a lot of that connected because she, he had expressed such a history around his connection with, um, with animals in his past. Um, so the self-reflections is really, um, really critical. Now another example of, of it was um, this individual who, uh, I usually bring a little prop, um, who loved the pickles at Ryan's Deli. Has anyone stopped at Ryan's Deli? Where is it? Ryan's Deli is right down um, between here and New Haven, right off um, uh, right north of Hartford. <laughs> so a lot of us, it's actually from, from Starbridge down to New York, down uh, 84. Well, a lot of, when I drive to New York, I often stop it. But he loved the pickles there. And he had not gotten out of his apartment in ages. He had significant health issues. His, his daughter-in-law hated him, so wouldn't let her husband, his son, stop at Ryan's Deli to get him pickles. Um, so he reflected on this, and very isolated, very lonely, and a friend of mine happened to, her mother happened to live in the same assisted living. Um, and I said, oh, I, you know, um, I go to Ryan's Deli all the time, blah, blah, blah. They brought him back pickles. He connected with her, um, and he used some of his home care money to bring in a band in the apartment where he lived, because he also loved music. And he got out of his apartment for the first time in months, and you know became almost the social director. And you know the people who were more um, could not leave their apartment. He would go to their apartments and blah blah blah. blah. He died six months later because of his you know, medical condition. But the last six months of his life was such a high quality because he simply mentioned pickles um, at Ryan's Deli. So the whole self-reflections is really critical, you know, in terms of you know that those kinds of connections and how it has you think about how else to you know really pull resources to the person. Um, the next is the circle of support and creation of the team, which I'll get into in, in a minute. Um, you know, the third is, is information on the communication, health assistance, and accommodation needs. So we, I mentioned the accommodation needs earlier. It's also really to get a sense of those critical, you know, health care issues um, that people should know about could have an impact on, on, on services if it's something that triggers asthma, for example. Um, Oftentimes, people forget that there are these other things going on in the person's life that are critical as you focus in on the person in terms of plan. And you know, as we talked about the skills and strengths, the personal preferences, what works and doesn't work, whether it's the color of the shirt or how you approach the person. You know, each of us respond differently depending on how people approach us. Um, so what works for the person, what doesn't work for the person. Um, we talked a little about this, about the quality factors and values, what must continue in his or her life, um, what is critically important. Working with them about setting their vision for the future. Again, it could be three days from now or three years from now, you know, depending on, on the individual. Um, the other critical thing is the action plan, 
you know, a time frame and who's responsible as you identify things. And this toolkit has some, you know, forms if you want to <coughs> kind of use them. And the person's evaluation on the progress and effectiveness, um, and then just the ongoing continuous, um, you know, process. So it's, ca it's capturing all of that in terms of that thinking. And as you develop an action plan, it's really uh, moving from that planning to, um, to action. Because how many people have had great plans that just maybe well written, sit on your shelf and never get looked at again, or you know, just never get implemented? Has that happened to anyone? <laughs> so it's it's really then creating the action plan um, for change. Um, it's obviously no good. Our set of planning is no good without implementation. It focuses in on the outcomes, not the process. Again, it's not let's call five people together for a meeting. It's really, um, you know, what's the outcome going to be for the person? And and the the planning process is really just the um, beginning. Um, <clears throat> so that's basically, you know, in two seconds, the framework of person of planning with each of its components. To me, you know, really the the critical one in terms of the underpinnings of everything is the circles of force. And a lot of that is because a lot of people um, that I'm sure that you've worked with and will work with in the context of the um, ACOs are very isolated and lonely. Um, or they don't really have a lot of connections, a lot of support, a variety of different reasons. But if even if they did, um, you know, a lot of people you know, do need, you know, do need more connections and want more connections and need more people to support them in various ways. I mean, we all may have, um, you know, a lot connected in our lives, but we may have some missing pieces. And, you know, some of us make those connections fairly easily, and some of us don't. We all, you know, need help in different, um, you know, different ways. Um, and that's part of the real focus on circle and support, is what, it, what, the, what is the person currently have in their connections, and where are some of the missing pieces. Um, you know, I went to a legislative um, uh, workshop that we had um, for families to meet local legislators to do some advocacy. And um, to make a long story short, someone introduced me. Someone was pointing out everyone who was there, just telling me who everyone was there. And um, <laughs> this one person uh, who was there, you know, her smile appealed to me. And, you know, I just felt awkward going up to her, you know, whatever the reason was. And um, I asked, you know, the person who also who knew her, um, you know, my, if she might be interested in kind of meeting me. And uh, so then I asked her how old she was, or you'll see why in a second. I'm not telling the story right. But the person said, <laughs> the person said she, you'll, you'll get it. The person said she was in her early 40s. I said, okay, forget it. I can't go out with anyone who's closer to my daughter's age than my age. Um, she needs to be older. So it's the reverse, I think, of what you were thinking. Um, but then someone else said, no, 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 she's, she's not that young. Um, and then she asked her if she wanted to meet me, et cetera, et cetera. So I needed that kind of help to, uh, you know, connect with someone. So, yes, yeah, we're living together. <laughs> She'll be very happy that you all laugh. So Rosie's the daughter who has yeah, autism. Um, but I mean, it worked out great. It seems. Yeah. Um, so we all need help in different ways. But, but in order to get there, yeah, you have to have a focus on it. You know, and you have to listen to like the person who mentioned to me about World War II. Um, or if the person goes to Dunkin' Donuts on a regular basis, um, you know, they may not know people there, but there might be some possibilities there. I had a car that had 300,000 miles, and you know, my, my mechanic was just someone prior to that, that you know, I brought my car in, he did the oil changes, whatever, and I paid him, and that was it. 
But whereas my car got closer and closer to 300,000 miles, I was there every week. So he became a closer friend. Um, so it's really, um, the focus is obviously the person is the decision maker. The circle of support is a group of people who agree to meet on a regular basis to help the person attain their hopes and dreams. Um, and again, the meetings doesn't have to be, everyone has to be there. It could, whatever, you know, form makes sense. Um, there needs to be some clarity what the role and expectations are of the people involved in that person's circle. Um, the balancing, you'll see in a, in a minute, it's really, a lot of times people's support network is only paid staff. Um, so you, you, know, you want to have you know, people that are both paid that you know, may be interested as well as obviously unpaid. The decreasing, the isolation and loneliness. And in many ways, the circle is a key to the safeguards. So if there's some anxiety about what the person may want to do or some you know, kind of checking in that may have to happen with the individual, you, know, you think about that with that network of supports, just like a lot of us have. Um, in terms of people helping out in different ways or, or checking in or whatever. So there are four standard um, kind of circles. Um, you know, intimacy is obviously people that's closest to you. So if you had, if you weren't feeling well at two in the morning, okay, do you have some, someone to call? You know, if you're not living with anyone. Um, I mean, again, it stimulates kind of thinking. Um, you have something to call for if there was good news or bad news. Is there someone who you feel most intimate with? And for a lot of people, when they're asked that question, not quite this way, um, it's, it, for many people, it's a staff person. And because they view the staff person as the one closest to them. I mean, the staff person doesn't necessarily view that. Um, but it's an indication, you know, of, of kind of the missing pieces. Um, then, obviously, there's friends, you know, people you would go out to dinner with or go to the movie or, you know, um, go to Six Flags or whatever it might be. Um, then there's people that you may see if you go to church um, on a regular basis, but you don't really have a friendship with them. You're certainly not real close to them, but you see them every week at, at church. and. Um, then there's individuals that you just see to, if you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you pay for a cup of coffee. So those are the four more traditional ways of thinking about the circle of supports. And people kind of move both in and out of the circle. And some people, as I said, need support to, um, if there's someone they see at church every week, and you know that, you know, how do you maybe help possibly play a role in making those connections so they become closer to each other. Maybe share some common interest, whatever it might be. I mean, there's someone, there's a group of people I met with, and they talked about, one person talked about really wanting to learn more about how um, uh, TV shows are made. Right? So this was in Boston, and then someone else there said, oh, Emerson College has a, um, a set of, I don't know, everybody loves Raymond, but some TV show, there's a set at Emerson College. So this just came up a, a couple of weeks ago. So then, you know, we started talking about, um, you know, the person who said they have a set, you know, connecting them together. And it turned, it, it so happens that Fran's brother graduated from Emerson College, and he's very involved with that. So I'm going to ask him whether he's willing to kind of lay some groundwork so maybe this person could connect with someone at Emerson College. So there's various ways to kind of stimulate that. Um, but people move in and out. The, as, we, as we have our own experiences, you know, friends become enemies, you know. Um, we break up with someone. Um, people who we see at, at a Dunkin' Donuts or at church become our friends, you know, a variety of different kind of levels. Um, when I did this training um, a lot, number of years ago, through the training, we actually added these last two. Um, a lot of people talked about the need for someone to help them learn. Um, has anyone had a mentor in their life that has made a difference with you? You want to give an example? You weren't going to say anything else. So no, not, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> let's say for someone else. No. Yeah, I'm not just joking. There you go. Not just joking. <laughs> So 
we all learn, we all have had experiences, well, many of us have, with mentors, people that have helped us. So um, as we did these trainings, we said we really need to identify this as a separate area so we could really focus in on, like if someone has a particular skill they want to learn, if they want to be a DJ or something like that, and how to connect with someone who can mentor them, or if they want to start a business, or you know, if they just want to learn how to, um, how to sew, whatever it might be. Um, and the last one, which really has stimulated a lot, is, is people they want to reconnect with. You know, people that they haven't seen in years, in years, and years, and have lost connection with them. Um, and so how to help foster that. But you can't foster that unless you know there's people that that person may want to reconnect with. So in, in going through these kinds of discussions, which a lot happens naturally um, in terms of the circle of supports, you kind of, you don't necessarily have to use this, but this is a way to visualize. I mean, this is another way. But this is a way to visualize, I'll get back to that. No. <laughs> this, this is a way to visualize, you know, the person in the middle, um, you know, the intimacy would be in that circle closer to the person, and circle of supports. And then the friendships and the uh, participation and exchange. And then it's kind of connected in here. We haven't figured out where to stick the mentors and people who want to reconnect with. Um, because a mentor could become a close friend, and uh, it's a little different than participation. Some of them you just see, you know, at um, Dunkin' Donuts every morning or once a week, whatever it might be. So when you look at this, you know, for a lot of people you work with, how do you think it looks if you really plotted names of people around? Not very full. Yeah. It'd be maybe some people on the outside, maybe no one in the inner circle. Um, so it gives you a visual on how to work and then working with the individual on A, creating the team. Because it's a great process to identify who the person wants to be part of their team. Part of working with them on, on planning um, what they want out of their lives, on planning the specific things that they may want to do. Um, but as members of their team. Because a team should be more than just the physician, the healthcare professionals, and you, and maybe a couple of people who, um, who are providing direct services, whether it's a PCA or the AFC caregiver or whatever. So it helps really frame that. You know, who, sh who initially might be members of the team, and where are their places <laughs> that there's opportunities to really um, you know, expand on that. Um, you know, this this is a little more complicated way to do it, but it's basically another way to plot people's relationships, you know, with with friends, family, you know, pay support. Um, the one in the middle is the more the, similar to what I just went through, the intimate friends and family, neighborhood acquaintances, pay support. A little different. Um, and then the connections with, um, you know, community resources, whether it's who's in your neighborhood, the senior center, the corner store, church, wherever it might be. Um, so as I said, when the Robert Johnson Foundation, you know, did their evaluation, um, at the start of the process, you know, there weren't all of these people. And at the end, the, the, the greatest way to measure the person's quiet of life as they expressed it was that that there were more un people who were not paid as part of their team than paid staff because um, it, it led to you know all kinds of other um, things happening um, you know so yes there was someone they could call if there was some good news there was someone they could go see the movie they wanted to see as opposed to if they were living in a group environment a lot of people all have to go to the same movies. And we all have same, very dramatic differences in our taste. Uh, sometimes we can convince someone else to um, like what we like, and sometimes it's, there's no way that's going to happen. Um, so one of the things Fran likes now is zombie movies. She never would have thought she could ever enjoy a zombie movie until I made her sit through <laughs> um, and if you haven't seen iZombie, it's really funny. 
in TV shows. But anyway, um, so it's really a real focus about this. Um, actually, I, I should have explained that a little more so you don't think that somebody's going wrong with me. But uh, um, I Zombie is a very funny show where she's a zombie, she's the brains of people who are murdered, and then she has vision and solves identify who, <laughs> who the uh, criminal was. So, it's, it's, so there's a lot of funny parts for it. Um, anyway, so you want to have a focus on this. I mean, this to me is the most important thing, because everything will flow from this. Um, so are there any questions before I move on around either the uh, circle of supports or the um, components of the person of planning? Just one. Um, so as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking um, two things are kind of standing out for me. One is that you're introducing some ideas that really don't cost a lot, but it's always a good thing when funds are from the state or government, right? And the other thing is that I'm thinking of um, like the supports as more of a creating an opportunity for that person to make their own connections. So um, maybe not so much a um, service provider or a, or a type of service that might already be available, but when you're linking their interests and looking at what's available in the community, where could they, what could they do that might increase um, there are opportunities to meet people with similar interests right. something to that effect. It's just, it's, it's kind of neat because, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess I never thought of it that way before, even though I always thought of myself as being somebody who did person interest right. I just didn't think of that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Amber was talking about this. She said, um, she was at that, like, as you were giving me an example, this means that she uses a lot of non-traditional supports and I was saying, you know, she's right. Like, you're, it, it seems that you're communicating people to people. No, no, absolutely. I think that's the, I mean, we've done somewhat of a disservice over the years um, where uh, we created a lot of segregated state-funded services. And, and that really, even though people moved out of institutions into communities, people were not really part of the community and, and lost the, that those, or well, never had, um, <coughs> that the incentive to make those connections. So everything was, was staff driven or driven by paid staff for solutions had to be paid staff. When, and, when, and therefore no one could put a focus on this. So this is really expanding that network, which ultimately does save money, but but almost more importantly, it just creates all these connections for the well, person that, is, yeah. that, that improve their quality of life, <laughs> whether they want to learn how to cook or how to, um, you know, the cooking is a, is a good example. There was someone who said, you know, they're trying to get the money to find, to pay someone to come in and teach the person to cook. And then someone said, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just go to the vocational high school? Have him go to the vocational high school, um, go to a cooking class, and he might meet other people and you know, really connect with them, and they can help you know, teach them. The best thing of one of the things I did, and I show how bad of a cook I am, is I, I prided myself in my turkey meatballs. Um, and I don't know how it came up, but we, was, we had a meeting with an individual and the person mother was there and she she said you know you really should put in parmesan cheese when you're making the meatballs because you already knew that yeah and never I never knew that and so my meatballs got 100 percent better but so i got a lot out of it too <laughs> in terms of this process it's also benefiting you were you gonna uh, what were you gonna yeah, no, no 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 you have to no i'm not i'm not after the class <laughs> so um <laughs> So it's really important and to think about this. I mean, people, someone who might be legally blind, who can't read the newspaper, um, but would love to hear what they're writing about the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. Leave this out what happened last night. But, um, and there might be someone else who really loves the Red Sox and would love to you know, make a connection and read to the person and have that. 
you know, someone who might be isolated in different ways. So there's a variety of ways to kind of make those, um, those connections. I have a question. Um, how, how can us as volunteers or whatever be Anybody has this information, that's the way of you know reaching well, out. Since you said that, I did have one other idea. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it's a great networking pool. Though. Yeah, 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 no, that's and a great idea. Something that works for our agency was connecting with the local college. <laughs> like if they're going to school for nursing or social work, there's a lot of people that need um, like intern hours yeah. and stuff for the volunteer. Yeah, it's and they're it's trusted. It's so that's a way to identify people. I think the point you were making is you might find someone who's interested in um, NASCAR. You have no clue that you have someone. Well, I think we take people up to NASCAR a lot. Oh, okay. and they oh, know. Know. Yeah. 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 So, we're already going to meeting up after. Where do we get our number first? So, so let me answer the best thing first. Yeah. But did you have? Yeah. We really want to answer. Okay. So, this is a great example. You mentioned NASCAR. You said, oh, wait a minute. We go up there once a week. From Monster Jam. Yeah. And, and you get connected. I mean, our, the agency I work with, our board president, shockingly, is interested in NASCAR. Um, so, if you had a, a discussion like this around an issue or any different people's interests, like the example I gave around the, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the TV set, you would probably get numerous examples like the NASCAR. I mean, I, I think I freaked this person out from the federal government, CMS, because I had just met with the person. <coughs> who wanted to go skydiving. So we had a meeting of this committee I'm on. She was there. And the person wanted to do a, a what's it called when you, you do, do a little get to know you exercise, or whatever. Icebreaker. Icebreaker, sorry. Um, so we went around the room, and she happened to say how she loves skydiving. We were all supposed to tell something about ourselves. So I said, that, then it came to me, and I said, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you want to meet this other person who's really interested in skydiving? 
because she wanted no part of that. But she might have. And, and so if you have a group like this, and we started talking about the people we know and what their interests are, I think a lot of things like this NASCAR example would come up. The question you raise about risk is a critical Because there are some people that I think want to potentially do a background check on. I mean, there's some rules in some programs where you have to do a background check. Some other programs, you don't. The PCA program right now does not require a background check for me. And at some level, background checks give people a full sense of security. So what I would say to you is, depending on the person, it's either you work with the person on what he or she should do if, some, if they feel they're at risk or vulnerable or whatever, or you get and or you get to know the person better um, before you would feel comfortable having them go out alone. <coughs> There's no easy answer because you're never going to get to know the person as well as going to make you totally comfortable. They're not going to do something. Um, but just like with our own friendships, you know, you don't know. I mean, people get abused, sadly, in multiple different ways. Um, and you don't, for my own feeling, is you don't want to let that stand in the way of making those connections. But you may want to play out some, you know, steps before with the person that the person could understand. You just want to make sure you have the right safeguards in. And, and maybe initially they would feel comfortable someone from their circle going with them with that other person. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, um, as Rosie is, is looking for a caregiver, um, you know, the, the, her father wants to put the potential caregiver through 20 levels of approvals, and he's still not going to necessarily feel comfortable. I mean, she's gorgeous. It's not that I'm biased, but yeah. so I'm worried, you know, about it. I mean, the, she's very friendly, you know, she has no awareness of, of you know, people who might tell, be taking advantage of her. So it is, it's not an easy process um, and it's to kind of feel comfortable. But at some point, you there are some risks in as people make more and more connections, like, like with anything. So you just have to think through that um, and build in some safeguards potentially. I was just going to say that it equals the person. You know, like you don't know yes. what kind of clients are you putting with other people. You know, it's just you're, you're yeah. taking that risk that the individual is going to be <coughs> is gonna be comfortable and not cost the other person some you know, difference. Exactly. It's just so you, want, you, you just want to think through that and play it out, and but it should not be a barrier or a hindrance to really making those connections. Um, I mean, there's someone who, who I know, so she, um, he has a lot of uh, history of some, you know, uh, behaviors in the community. So he's on, that staff always have to be with him at this point in terms of some of what he did. And he, he expressed through, you know, these kinds of discussions, this happened years and years ago. Why can't initially, rather than the staff standing right with me, why can't they just behind, behind me and watch? Mm -hmm. And let me be alone for a little bit. And then, you know, play. So he, he actually <coughs> was able to verbalize in some ways, you know, that there has to be steps to him to be totally independent in the community without staff there. Um, you know, as, and you're walking that, that line. Um, so, yeah, there's no answer to that. I mean, the more people get connected with people, the more risk they're going to be. It's clear. But that's part of the reason why a lot of people only have paid staff. Um, and you, you kind of have to use your judgment and balancing out that the person should really be in charge, but you have your own your own anxieties and you have some role, you know, and responsibility <coughs> and you want to, you know, kind of balance that out. Um, but the focus on this, I think, will generate a lot more connections for people. I mean, you're not forcing friendships, you're creating opportunities for people to connect. 
And someone could help them on World War II and not be a friend. Um, you know, it's, it's someone that they're learning from. Um, but a lot, if you don't get that opportunity, it's not going to turn into friendships. And, you know, I think more often than not, it will turn into friendships. Um, this, this was, uh, we've got to start taking risks and we want to see the world. This was someone after 9-11 uh, where a lot of parents want to say, I want to take more risks, and their children wouldn't let them. And, you know, so the, this person, 71, was saying, I need to do more things. My life is short. Um, and his daughter was not, was trying to prevent him from taking risks. Um, you know, one, one thing that someone had brought up is their father and um, his friend, they loved going out on, on uh, rowboats or canoe, I don't know which. And the boat capsized and they both died. And, and the daughter was getting lectured. How did you let your father go out on this boat alone? It's not that he wasn't capable, accidents sadly happened. And she said it was so great that he died doing something he loved, you know, loved to do. Um, so, you know, the risk is a tricky one. Um, this would consider every potential risk except the risk of avoiding risks. Um, because if you don't take risks, there's a big part of your life that's, um, you know, that's missing. I, um, I talked about both of these, um, which is a key, is never lose sight of the, um, of the person. Um, and part of it is, you know, you just need to stop accepting what is and stop creating what should be. Because we're, we're, a lot of times we're caught up in the way things have been. And part of the excitement and the energy behind person planning is really what should be for people who need supports. Um, just because someone needs supports doesn't mean they give up, you know, the, the kind of life that we all want for ourselves and, um, and others. So clearly what, what we all hope will happen um, as this evolves is there's meaningful integration across physical health, behavioral health, and long-term service and supports. And I, I always add meaningful because there's ways that you could identify that things are a little more integrated but it's really meaningful in terms of how that impacts the person's quality of life and the person really being in control of their life. So there's a connection. There's a real connection between quality services in the community and the impact on someone's health. Um, it's, it's direct. Um, the connections that people have in the community and their impact on their life. Um, certainly we you know, an outcome is empowering people with disabilities. So they really feel that they're in control. Um, someone said to me, you know, their dream is to go to um, Hawaii on vacation. And before they got the word out, they said, no, 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 our, our cruise is fine. Because in their mind, they knew that the staff much preferred to go on a cruise. Mm. Forget about the staff's, um, right. you know, own, uh, why would someone go on a, want to go on a cruise more than going to Hawaii? So forget about their own personal preference and their own choice. They immediately, the person diverted to what they felt the staff would prefer to do. Um, we've talked about decreasing loneliness and isolation, um, greater inclusion in their community in multiple ways, and, um, and better health. So those are the outcomes that we want to have through you know, really this focus per set and planning process. Um, so why don't I kind of stop, and are there any last um, questions or comments or feedback? Yeah. My concern is that we're going to be working with a lot of population mm -hmm. that doesn't have a lot of income. Mm -hmm. and a lot of things that they might want to do requires to have funds. Do you know of any funds that we'll be able to, yeah. or are we going to be able to have some sort of, you know, ways? <laughs> I'm looking at her because she has a... But so, that's, that's their nature right now. It's not like the lack of resources, it's the lack of, you know, they're, they're poor. So, um, where I work, we happen to have a focus. We did, one of the initiatives was Summer of Fun, um, where, so we had a focus on fundraising. 
-hmm. to get, get money donated for summer fun, and then individuals who we support could basically identify what they want to do for fun over the summer, and then they get funding through this. Um, we also um, have been able to access some you know, money from local banks who we'll give back five to ten thousand dollars to the community, and we use that to fund, you know, individuals who don't really have money, um, you know, to pay for various things. Mm -hmm. And we got a also um, a separate fund for family caregivers. Um, you know, people who have their sons and daughters living with them, or they have parents living with them, and don't have the funding. So we also have gotten grants and donations and created this fund where we give family caregivers up to um, $500. Um, now, we always get 100. It's not really a proposal, but just a paragraph for what the family wants. And we're able to fund 20 each year. Um, but so we do focus in on trying to get money for that specific purpose. And have found that it really resonates with a lot of people. The communities also offer a lot of free opportunities. I mean, on our website, we are constantly posting free concerts, free um, during the month of May, you can go to cultural venues for free. The library sponsors all, a whole wide range of programs that are all free. It's, you know, so I think the community is already providing a lot of these activities. It's not going to Hawaii, but there's still a lot of um, wonderful things. Like I, I will tell you, there's a we live in Berkshire County, and there's a, a choral group in Pittsfield. Um, and I always say people have a right to pursue happiness. So I've always told people, join a music group. There's plenty of free ones. And there is a concert group um, in Pittsfield. Um, they perform very professionally two or three times a year. But I have consumers that are in the chorus. They have people with mental health issues, physical disabilities. And the whole reason they're in that chorus is because they all love the music. And we even had a couple meet and get married. They never thought they would meet anybody. And, and it was through this joint. But, and this was a free choral group that they joined. Once a week, they had a purpose to gather. So I think we, ha we, we can look at the big expense of things, but there's so many free things in our own communities people can afford. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like free events in the community. Like yeah. the exact yeah. free and for some of them, I mean, the first example I gave is things that cost 25 or $50 dollars that people don't have. But through a lot of those activities, then you're identifying people in the community that, that would take, you know, work, become friends, and they provide the transportation, whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. And like that's the a key fairs, They want people to come see their stuff so they make it free. How else? I mean, I just got an email about all the things that it, I don't know if they have it here. I think it was in Boston, Free Friday. Yeah. 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 So there's, yeah, there's plenty of reasons. Well, folks can have DDS services if they want to take vacation. There's a carousel fund that both has applied to every other year. So a lot of it is the money, a lot of it is the connection, that people connect with others to help to take them or become friends, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You're going to? If you have EBT, and like Austin on Fridays, they do free museum days. And then it's sharing. You know, it's, it's what you had said about how do you share both you know, what's available yeah. and people that may have a special interest. I mean, you know, one of the schools I work with, there was the learning pages, um, the yellow pages of learning resources. And all it was, was here's everyone in the, in, within the broad school system who had a skill that they were willing to, you know, train someone and, and then people who were interested just connect. Now this is before internet and everything else. So it was literally the yellow pages, and um, people then could see. Oh, you I, I could train someone in cooking or whatever it might be, and then connect. Okay, great. Well, I hope this was helpful. It's really exciting to see so many of you here. Good luck.